Okay, yeah. did you guys see that bonkers comment? I just want to ask real that yeah. celibacy as a Catholic priest is not required. Somebody said you are 100% incorrect about celibacy being required of Catholic priests. It's just encouraged. Come on. I don't I was like I I'm asked, pretty sure it's a Catholic canon. I'm almost positive it's a Catholic canon. I asked um my wife's family her my in-laws who up until sophia um converted to orthodoxy have been catholic 70 year over 70 years they had never heard that before and i was I'm like, looking right now catholic well the pope priest. is now shocker talking about taking it away so yeah that's celibate requirement uh, okay, Canon 277 of the Code of Canon Law, promulgated in 1983, states, Clerics are obliged to observe perfect and perpetual continence for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, and therefore are bound to celibacy, which is a special gift of God by which sacred ministers can adhere more easily to Christ with an undivided heart. I don't know how much more you need than that. It's a canon. It's Canon 277. Was that canon established in 1983? Promulgated in 1983. What does that mean? I don't know what that word means. I have no idea. But that's Father, what it do you know says. what that means? I mean, essentially, it's you know they like ratified. And, okay. Okay. You know, so yeah, I don't know. You know, YouTube comments. Even if there are YouTube comments, what are you gonna do? <laughs> Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight, I'm going to ask Father and Cyprian, how you guys, how confident are you guys on your ability to handle or discern slang from the 1920s, not the 2020s, Ooh. from 100 years ago? We're going to give it a shot, all right? Not, I'm not confident, but this sounds interesting. You shouldn't be confident. These no, are really, okay. really weird. This okay, is very, good. very weird. It's very okay. like um other otherworldly. It's like Okay. It feels like um like an alternate earth or something like that. Okay. Okay. Because not last week, but the week before that we did slang from whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna go hundred years back. Okay. Alderman. Do you know what an alderman is? And not the government position. Do you have any guesses? No. Okay. It's uh hold on. It's like a like a like an old person, like a geezer, like a like a, a slang for a, a bad slang for an old guy. This is how we went from Latin to Italian because okay. slang just does damage, like untold damage to a language or whatever okay. advances it or whatever. That's referring to a man's gut. Is your alderman <laughs> is showing? So that yeah. makes sense. No, that makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's your, it's your, it's your, it's, it's, it's marking you as, as older in age. Your gut, you know? Yeah. yeah no, I I mean, I can see it. Yeah. It's just like an example is just like, Hey, your alderman showing like, you know, I want to pull your shirt down. Your alderman showing. It's like, oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. So drift. Yeah. Like you, you get my drift. Like, uh, Yeah. No? no, again, Cyprian, I think you're just always going to be a little bit to the left on it or a little bit to the right. I don't know. Um, but it's to leave. It's like, I'm going to drift out of here. <laughs> like, I, it's just like, it's so it's, it's more fast and furious related than you realize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel no. I feel like I've heard that used. Yeah, I feel like I've heard the word used that way. I'm going to drift on out of here. Yeah, I mean, I would be, I would have not have a problem with any of these slangs making their way back into my day to day use. I'm actually going to start using that one, by the way. I'm going to be like, "Hey, man, I'm gonna drift on out of here." This one is cool. Um, drop a dime. Yeah, oh yeah, drop that's to dime. give information. Yeah, that's, that's like cool. to rat on someone. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, like, yeah, he's gonna drop yeah. a dime. Um, okay. You know what that is, right? Uh, 
pay phone pay phones yeah pay yeah, phones yeah. and yeah they didn't want the tra- calls to call trace back to him or whatever no 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 it's no tracing. there was there no, no tracing it's, just, it's there's no tracing it's literally a dime like that's what it was for like to pay for the phone call you oh put it in there like sure yeah. okay yeah oh yeah sorry yes yeah my kids would never like this is what i'm thinking about like that would make no sense to them. Not only ever. that, yeah. it will never make sense because I don't think they've ever seen a payphone. Well, not only that, kids they don't do this for cell for phones anymore. We used to do they that don't? as phones. They do this, like they when they're do? playing phones, yeah, or whatever. Like kids don't when they're like they're like hello and they go like that. My kids go like this. Whoa, yeah, of course. Because why would they? There's they've no never handset, seen this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, weird. <laughs> uh, a gooseberry lay. I'm not even going to attempt that one. No, it's when you steal someone's clothes from their clothing line. It's just like, I don't what? know. I'm just saying. I didn't think you guys were going to be able to get these, but a they're gooseberry you know, lay. Yeah. Just be like, uh, what the, the example that they give here is do not gooseberry lay on your neighbors. I am warning you. That means like stealing their clothes from their clothing line. I from, think the clothes line. from the clothes Goose, line. From the clothes line. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not. I think someone might have thought like, does everyone have their own designer line? Yeah, no, the no. clothing like, line. Like, like the clothes line, where like it's no, dry. no, no, no. <laughs> Someone's drying, and you go along and steal it. And this is my favorite, yeah. and the last one is hitting on all eight. Eight cylinders. Hitting on all eight. It's that. That's like eight cylinders. Yeah. You're doing great. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's been so like long, bro. It. I've You're been hitting focused. on all eight. Yeah. You're all about it. Yeah, it's great. that's still in use. Perfect. That's still in use. Yeah. Well, it's glad I'm glad that some of these made it, but um, mm-hmm. boy, it was just mm-hmm. delightful going back and seeing, you know, at the height of Art Deco, what the slang of the day was. So that's what it was. So anyway, that's my intro, um, and I'm now realizing I don't have anything past that. Do you guys have anything you want to talk about? I think we had a we well we we had a couple of topics. We had a couple yeah. of topics. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> there's it's it's just it's it's hard to it's hard. There's to one decide, particular like, which, which Oh, one before we get started, I have a couple right. questions for Father. Yeah. Okay, so about bishops, I had questions about a couple questions about bishops. Uh-huh. So um, we just had we're visited by our bishop, uh, Vladika. Incredible weekend, absolutely amazing real stand-up guy 100 percent. like it was a very very good week how come bishops can bless with both hands like you know like is what okay what's the symbolism behind that well um why did the bishop cross the road i don't know <laughs> to get to the other side <laughs> no, bishop crosses everything <laughs> Uh, that's that's yeah, actually yeah. solid. Yeah, I, I honestly I don't know. I, okay. I don't know. I know there's some reason we could say you know everything I would say would just be me riffing. I don't know, but bishops have that power to bless with with both hands. But I can I tell you there's like the DK the Trinity carry. There's like the two candles and the three candles. Did you notice that? Mm-hmm. That's obvious, right? Two sure. natures of Christ, the Holy Trinity. Okay, so, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I um okay, and then what was the other one? There was another okay. Do bishops serve communion? Yeah, he served to the nuns. He oh, he served it to the nuns. Okay. Yeah, he communed the nuns and then he, he went back in the altar. Okay. Okay. I didn't see that. So I was just wondering if that was like But a, is that but like is that a thing that a bishop won't serve to like laity, that they would only serve to clergy and monastics or something? Um, not a thing as like it's propriety, but a lot of times it's you know the bishop like, will have the the priest serve you know so they can just kind of go and watch and you know I don't say relax but you know um, repose you know in the altar or whatever so yeah. yeah okay yeah I mean I think that was it there was just some stuff because you know shocker I'm not around bishops a lot. And then I was just like, oh, there's there's some stuff here that's that's different about him, you know? So um Yeah. Well, our bishop's a Christian. That's the first thing. Boy, is he ever. And 
And to say that it's kind of someone might be like, well, duh, but it's like, no, it's not duh anymore. Um, yeah, he's he's a Christian. He's Ladiga is wonderful, so that yeah, was very good. Yeah. Ooh, that brings us. That's a great segue to the topic that we were talking about. There you go. That's a great great segue to yeah. to um, because and it came up and as people had said in the comments, like it's not the royal path until Jordan Peterson gets mentioned. So people could just time, <laughs> time stamp it. Just time stamp it right here. His oh, father this. sent sent yeah. over that he had a bunch of icons. On, now he's got a jacket with a bunch of icons on it. Well, specific the softener of evil hearts. Specific the softener of evil hearts. Yeah, yeah which is totally totally wild, and it's not. It's no way on accident. That's the thing. No, well, I just let's just jump into it. Let's do it. And and the thing is, your analysis was you know wow. It was really good because I almost like if you want to pull up, if you want to just read verbatim what you put out there, because I was like, I could do it. Like, I could read it. But while you're doing that, I would just say this links back to, I don't know if it's going to, the pre-cut is going to make it into the, into the show, but you were talking about corruption of power on high mm-hmm. levels. And it's just like villain card feels like villain card on a lot of these people just feels like it's, it's getting, or the curtain that's covering people's, you know, villainy, like, you know, um, three quarters of the way in of unbroken or unbreakable. And you're like, uh, is it glass? What is he? You know what I mean? Yeah. It feels like you're getting to the point where like, okay, I can start really saying no more ambiguity. You're a villain. You're a villain. You're a villain. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, so what I said, what I said about it uh, when you you posted that picture is, I said, "Well, hold on, Cyprian. What did ahead. I say first off?" Andrew I said, said we, "Well, hold well, on, Andrew and Cyprian. <laughs> you guys should pull up the photo so everybody can see it." Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, uh, let me, uh, you know, because just, it, it uh, it's that. like, hold on one second, because it's too. I need, I need to put it here. His, his two face coat. <laughs> his Harvey Dent coat from like. No, it totally ago. is two face. That's like, exactly what he's doing. But it's just like it's getting like it, it's just getting. It's getting more obvious, is what it is, and yeah, it's, it's getting uh, George Clooney, George Clooney, Batman-ish, like real quick. You know? The the it's it's that saying the quiet part out loud. Thing yeah. Where yeah. it's just not hit. It's and which which you know is interesting because of the fact. Uh, Andrew, that the word that you that you said came to your mind, uh, which is very much about saying the quiet part out loud, was audacity, right? Mm-hmm. You were like the word that comes to my mind is audacity, and I think, yeah, that's I mean that's saying the quiet part out loud, right? Okay, here, let me pull this up. Um, okay, share screen. I purely, I completely sure, forgot I, I said that. I was really just talking about how we. Need to fire this man's tailor. So it's it this, is. yeah. Everybody can see. Mm-hmm. Do I need to? Yeah. How, I don't know how to zoom. No, I, I, I don't even know where he's at. But is that an icon in the back there? So obviously, is it? Like, oh, it's no. That looks like some sort of Eastern. Yeah, I right? can't tell what that is. Yeah, I can't tell. But anyways, yeah. So well, I think yeah, software so people arts right there, right? Yeah. down yeah. at the bottom on the sleeve yeah. oh it's through the whole it's through the whole side yeah. it's like yeah. he's got them all the way yeah oh there's oh how interesting is that but he's like you know yeah. he's 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 just the the controversy was and i think father you said it the best you know like outside of everything that people were like oh leave it alone and this and that and you know Peugeot sort of like holding water for him or whatever which is fine but you know you said it you were like jordan peterson is not a christian that's the bottom line Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like he's not a christian and so then you're like what are you doing and 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 again sorry so if you have to check out i'll see you later um people (laughs) but you know there's this whole thing about responsibility and speaking before kings and you know it's like who like imagine like he he was not going to show up speaking to netanyahu or whatever you know like i don't know wearing a 
uh, star uh, of David uh, uh, Coke. Y- y- yeah, you know what I mean. He wouldn't do that. No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't do that. Menorahs having menorahs all over his coat or yeah, something. Yeah, he, he, Hebrew he lettering. Yeah, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do that, and he wouldn't do that with, you know, some sort of, you know, I don't know. He would definitely wouldn't do it with like Muhammad because you know he'd be killed. But yep, like he wouldn't even like play with around with Rumi. You know what I mean? He wouldn't have like a right. Rumi like drawings from like from Khalil or anything like that. You know what I mean? From the prophet, he wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. And so the thing is, kind of on the one end, you could think he's like well, he's like, well, this is my tradition. I'm in the West, but it's not your tradition because yeah. you know what I mean. And that's fair to say because. Um, for all the things he gets so mad at Christians. I mean, there's that one interview with that one guy with the, I don't know, there was some random guy. There's these weird people on it, on YouTube who they have like the millions of followers. I've like never heard of them. Before. But mm-hmm. I saw this one and he's, I guess he was like, um, he's got like a thick beard and I don't know. I'm just, just going to describe some random human being. Point being is it was, it was, it was like this. It was like the week of the debut of the goal of the uh, soldier cross schema cross without right, the right, shirt right, right. jacket. And it was like it, I think it was like the same day he did the symbolic world conference. And there's some guy who used to be on a real popular podcast who's doing his own thing now. That's all I know. That's how I can describe him. Hispanic guy with the beard, and he interviewed him. And some quasi Christian guy. I don't know. Um, but it was weird to me because he was just going for it. Meeting Peterson, he's like getting mad at Christians. He's like, he's like, do you believe in God or whatever? He's like, Christians always ask me this, and he just he he gets all mad about Christians yeah. asking him he believes in God. So the reason I'm saying this is like it's not his tradition, people. And I I I mean, if we're done, if everyone's like, man, real bad, they just pastiche. They say the same thing over <laughs> again. Cool. I'm I'm totally good, man. Because I'm just gonna say it. Because as long as you got people who still let them have his ear, Orthodox Christians, whatever, it's like, at what point in time do you kind of go like, ugh, okay, you know? So anyways. But Father, I I mean, to to be fair, I think that there's also, and I think that this is, you know, and we've been doing this since the beginning of like, he's he's just an example of somebody who's gone all the way on something. But mm-hmm. I know, but there are people who are who are recent converts, who I was familiar with before they were converts, who were in, especially like on the libertarian side, who mm-hmm. I'm looking at, at at them and I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not attempting to judge, mm-hmm. but there's certain mm-hmm. things that are going on where like, mm-hmm. I'm not judging. I'm just getting a feeling. And the feeling is like you're trying to do what he's doing in a way. Mm-hmm. Like, well, read your quote. The, read your the, quote because I think okay. it's going to okay. really highlight what the re- like some of the insidiousness, the insidiousness that I think people just need to be aware of, you know? Um, okay. So. And and for context of this quote, the reason why I'm, I, I say this with such confidence for everybody, like, is because I did this at a certain part, point in my life, right? Like, I was I was this person doing this thing, and so it's like why I recognize it for what it is. So I said, it's a spell, it's a summoning circle or voodoo doll. By putting something on a suit, he is symbolizing it, like in quotes, taking all incarnational reality of it out of it, and restraining it within a metaphor. Once it is so constrained. As a master of metaphor, he can then use it as a tool in his occult mind control spells. It's crazy because it follows the same pattern of the new Disney movie Wish, which is so sophisticated in its occult narrative, where the Sorcerer King conjures a cursed staff so that he can trap an anthropomorphic wishing star inside of it. Peterson is very actively a sorcerer now. His whole tour of spirituality, like going to Athos, etc., was just Simon Magus behavior. So that Simon Magus portion, because someone, a lot of people who are unfortunately like jaded um, and cynical are kind of like, blah, 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 okay, whatever. They didn't want to hear half of what you said, if not all of it. But then I'll just use the Simon Magus part to just kind of like bonk them on the head about it. Because if you don't understand that portion, Mm -hmm. let's explain who Simon Magus was. So Simon Magus in the Book of Acts, um, basically sorcerer, who wanted to purchase 
the power bore witness to the power of the Holy Spirit, quote unquote, want to purchase that power from the apostles so that he could have power, you know, because he sees the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And that's essentially what Jordan Peterson is doing. Um, because the the trappings of morality, the trappings of self-empowerment, the trappings of healthy psycho- psychology, all the stuff, right? All those things are all great and dandy, but it's there's no Christ. And even the fact that someone would say the argument that's being made right now is so fundamentalist, you know, crude, you don't understand things. It's like, it's the other way around. And I have this thought always in the back of my head, you know, um, it's no matter what's going on, no matter like whatever the daily grind is in regards of temptations, everything's couched in, oh, we're in the last days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's like no matter, it, it, it doesn't matter whether your car is broken down or not, because it's like at any point in time, it's like, yeah, does everybody realize that um, Israel hit Iran? They didn't hit the nuclear facility, but they, they retaliated this last week. You know, it's like things are so thin, not just like, like we were talking about earlier in regards to the, the, the veil. Things are so thin in regards of that next step in history to just kind of like boom, 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 domino. It's fragile. Put it's fr- it feels fragile. Fra- thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Fragile. Things are so fragile. So I say that because, you know, Antichrist spirit is pumping real hard right now, real hard. And there was um, Father Stephen Andrew Damick, Father, um, I, always, I always flip his name. Um, I think you got it. Yeah. Um, but he did that video on the surge, which... Yeah. For him, for him in his context, I, I appreciated it because, um, you know, some of his conclusions from his anecdotal stuff was good. You know, some of like it's like uh, whatever, but it's his context, and like the reality is, is there's a whole side of things that I I don't think he was really wanting to fully acknowledge and go all in on. Father, um, forgive me. Can I say something before? But like, can I say something about that? Like, just in terms yeah. of the yeah. Mm-hmm. So. I found it very strange. Like once I got to the end, I was sort of like, huh. I was like that. What did I just watch in some ways? Because like he starts out by reading all of these things from people, right? Where they're like, we've never seen this amount of people here. But specifically, there's like three or four times where there's people saying we don't fit into our space anymore. Mm-hmm. We don't fit mm-hmm. into the space in our church anymore. We don't fit into the mm-hmm. space in our church anymore. But then at the end, he's like, well, but is it a really a net gain in people? Or yeah. is it like, or are we losing more people than are actually coming in? And I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't you just read the, th- do you understand how like a net gain, how you would assess a net gain if you were looking at a room you would be like, is the room more full now than it yeah. was before? That's a net gain. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not yeah, sure he but, understands what the word net well, gain means. Well, well, I'll push back on that and okay. try to be charitable to him is because I don't even know if he would even do that. I don't I don't know him personally, but he might be speaking about the absolute atrocious attrition we have of okay. young people like for as much as much as there's this influx of new converts that have come in, think of all the parishes, like through the Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, all these old parishes that like old Greek parishes, old Arab parishes, oh, like old, non you know, non convert parishes. Yeah, like they're you're, you're losing the ethnic. I mean, people. yeah, they're dying. Oh, okay, I mean, that makes sense. The, that makes sense. The kids are the kids are getting married out. You know, the sense. kids are, are just leaving. See. So when you look at it like that, I see, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll, but, I'll stand but, corrected on it. But, but I could be doing his work for him. He may not even mean that. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I'm just trying okay, to be, okay, okay. I'm just trying to be charitable to him. You know what I mean? Okay. But, but, but I could I'm see just, that, Father. I could definitely see yeah, it, it from that yeah. standpoint. 
yeah, maybe like your yeah. Greek church that has been in a predominantly Greek neighborhood for yeah. whatever yeah. amount of yeah. time in Pennsylvania, and now there's nobody yeah. in it. You know, because, what I mean? like because something else that he brought up, and like I haven't looked at the data, right? right? So it's all going to be whatever. But um, the idea that other churches are seeing growth as well. Ah, I would like to see that data, you know, because uh, I obviously there's anecdotal truth to it because it's anecdotal. And obviously I, I'm sure there's some statistic to it, but anecdotally for me, um, I can think of a couple of churches that have seen growth, but my context of what I see, and I got eyes, I got people, you know, I got people overseas. I got people uh in canada i don't really hear of some of these I, evangelical in these other churches like growing you know what i mean like they're well, kind for, of for, forgive me forgive me father i think if i recall i think he did specifically say that the churches that were seeing the growth were tradition were more traditional okay. liturgical churches yeah i do think he right. said that if i recall right and that distinction matters that distinction yeah, matters yeah. right so so with that being said you know the one thing is I liked what he said about, you know, the kind of people on the edge and kind of getting pushed off anyways, you know? And so they're looking for something. And I also appreciate, I don't think if you saw it, I don't, I don't think he said it, but I'll say it. Um, people are looking for stability and just on a social, on, on a kind of cultural social level with the, just the insanity of the liberal movements of like, gender and identity. He brought up identity politics a little bit, you know. So so all that makes sense. What I what I didn't like though, in and I don't know, I mean it's one of those things, it's like, are we in a sociology class or are we in church? Right? So sometimes, and this is part of the problem, is that churchmen Church folk, they want to play on the world's terms. That's why seminaries kind of what happens to them is they want to keep up with Ivy League and, and they want to keep up with Ivy League schools and they want to just look like they're on the same level foot. You know, we can play the big boys academically. We have the same rigors. And what happens is you don't really produce greater academic work, theologically speaking. You just get worldly watered down. <laughs> "Quote unquote theological, you know, church stuff." Does that make sense? Yeah, because it's you've all, moved. It's, it's like you've moved out of your lane in a way. You you're, moved playing, out of your lane. you're playing. You're playing in a, a field where it's not your forte. The mystical forte. is the, the mystical it, is it, the forte of not, the orthodox. Yeah, world. yeah. It's not your. It's not your rules. So the reason mm -hmm. why I think this is pertinent is because I appreciated the video on that level mm -hmm. but his analysis i was like oh man it's like you're a priest and you're an orthodox priest so speak it up it's like okay that's great all this is going on but he had this point is the orthodox church doing something different well no we've reversed these programs but what the orthodox church is doing obviously right is being the church because if we can look at, if, if those of you who can find it, Alexi Krindach, he did that study. He did a deep study on the churches. And maybe we can, I don't know if we can get away with pulling it up and put it in the, in the link. But Alexi Krindach, he does these, he's done it for years. Um, basically, Pew Research for the Orthodox Church in the, in the States. Um, and he did a deep dive on it, and he brought up things that are just real troubling for people. Things that statistics, right? Our statistics about the churches that closed during COVID and didn't. And remember, a gaggle of Orthodox churches, certain jurisdictions, whole hog, closed. Certain jurisdictions, you know, parishes, certain jurisdictions, whole hog did wild stuff liturgically. And what he shows in his data is that those who did changes, it's almost like the more changes you did to go along with the measures, the greater repercussions of not just the loss of people, but the, the amount of people that were sick, people that got sick, quote unquote, um, people's fi parishes and finances went down, right? And someone goes like, well, of course they went down because they closed. But when you look at the data, it's like, it isn't just that. It's 
it's there was a consistent growth in what we would say is blessing. I'm just going to interpret it, right? Parishes that were open, parishes that didn't do changes liturgically, they were blessed. And like, that's the thing. And um, the reality is that, yes, people are looking for something that's stable, that's ancient, that, that you know, is grounded. And the parishes and the communities that maintain that grounding have seen continued blessing. And I would argue that blessings overflow to the other parishes that didn't hold their ground, but are open and they're kind of ignoring it, right? So, for instance, there was um, maybe I could find it. Send you guys. Father, there's Father, Father, forgive me. Is this the Alexi Krindat? This is his blog. Yeah, yeah. Is this is this the study the the new traditional in a most traditional church? How the pandemic has reshaped American Orthodox Christian churches. What do lay people think about it? Yeah, that he said he's got two be... reports. I, that's that's one of them uh and still right there the executive summary and all that stuff full report yeah. you could like oh that's all there right okay um but i saw another one that i could send to you guys and i i, I try to remember where it was from but they were talking about even hey if you are inquiring it's okay for you to ask what was your response during the pandemic you know like this to act like mm. that didn't happen, which is what a lot of parishes are doing. Um, it, it's it's interesting to me in light of this, trying to examine why the surge, because to say that mm. the surge has nothing to do with what people experienced during the pandemic is disingenuous. And I'm not saying the father wasn't doing that, but I think that he was dancing around it a little bit in a way that to me, you know, and I'm not, I mean, obviously I have a side on it, but I think he could have done it even without picking a side and just kind of like teasing out some things, you know what I'm saying? Teasing out some discussion about it because the reality of it is, is it that you can't deny that. And you also can't deny, <clears throat> you can't deny, I mean, I'm sorry, you can't deny Jay Dyer. You can't deny Father Peter. You can't deny these just looking at their numbers. And there's been reports on quote unquote orthodox influencers and we've all been on panels talking about it, whatever. But just to kind of ignore that, I thought, you know, I just feels a little bit disingenuous too. Because even if you don't like it, right? And I'll, I'll just play devil's advocate, right? Because I was talking to somebody about this on Sunday. It's like, they were kind of making a comment about how I speak a lot about you know, you can't rely on the internet to catechize you, right? And I've done that here, right? I mean, that's that that's what we were talking about before, you know, I fell into a hole. Um, but I, I do that because I, that's, I, I get it. That's why we're here, you know, but see, I don't, we, I, we're not making any bones about why we're here. Like there isn't any like, I, why are we doing the real path? I'm, we do the real path because we want people to come to the Orthodox Church, and you want people to come to the Orthodox Church for the sake of Christ and not ideology. That's how I would sum up what this project is about. Period. Right. So the reality is, is like this is drawing tons of people, and to act like it's not the case, and to act like people who are hungering and thirsting for something in the midst of this wasteland. I don't know. That's just not the right move from my perspective. But again, you know, uh, I'm crazy. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I think I think the comment of like, it, it's almost like looking in the wrong place, right? That it's like, oh, well, what is the church doing differently is almost like, well, of course, the if it's the church, it's not doing anything different. Yeah. First off, right. yeah. like we don't we don't even have to ask the question, like because. Right. So only the, the church is not, it can't do anything differently, right? Mm -hmm. It can just be the church, right? First mm -hmm. off. So then, but really the question is like, oh, well, what's the world doing differently? And I think that what the yeah. world is doing differently is it's saying the quiet part out loud now. Yeah. And people can't deny anymore mm -hmm. and be like, oh, wait, then now the, the demons are showing now. They're like, wait, that's a demon. Just like the the, the guy because like, that was be a demon that was a demon yeah that was a demon because honestly that's the thing and like that is see that's the thing 
He didn't like forgive me. So I mean, I'm not trying to be um, what do you call it? Backseat driver, Sunday pitcher. I don't. But if I did that, I'd be like, look, the Holy Spirit is drawing people because the evil in this world got allowed has allowed it to be unveiled for to call people to repentance. Because overwhelmingly, what you see is people saw, oh, there's evil in the world, right? That goes back to Naomi Wolf. Remember, we talked about this not too long ago. Naomi, Naomi Wolf, the liberal Jewish, you know, uh, journalist. She's saying, I couldn't deny that there's evil, right? So to not say that and just to make it about the kind of sociological parameters of people staying home and people just want to get back together. Like, yeah, okay, that's part of it, but there's plenty of people who didn't go back to church. There's plenty of people who are like, ah, I can watch it online, and, you know, it's kind of nice being able to have bacon in the morning and go play golf, right? There's plenty of people who are like that. But a lot of the people who have come, they're like, yeah, I just, to sum it up, they saw evil. And they're like, okay, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's generally been the experience of the men, the young men, specifically the young men I've talked to who've come to our parish is they're just like, it wasn't a response to the culture. That's definitely there. And I've seen, um, I've seen one specific person that it was pretty much a response to the culture. And eventually he did kind of get weeded out a little bit. He's not coming anymore. Um, but most of the time it was, I just realized it's, it transcends like some kind of cultural shift towards the left that they realized, no, I was trying to hold on to traditional values. It represented something much more than that. There was like this total, like we were talking about, I don't know, I think it's going to make it, I don't remember what part we were talking about, but it was like, is this ramping up or am I just seeing it now? Am I, are my eyes open where I can see it or is it ramping up? And I believe we landed on its both and, right? Is that where, is that where, yeah, it's like. That's what we landed, that's what okay. I landed on, I don't know. Because it's yeah. like, okay, has this stuff always been happening and Andrew Funk is just now seeing it? Or is it genuinely just ramping up? And I think what some people saw was it ramping up of it being like, no, this is, this is, this is a real thing and we need something to counteract this. And the, and what I've been told is that this is the church to do that. This is the church that like yeah. Christ, this is the church that allows you to get close enough to Christ where this is the opposite. You know, this is like the, um, this is the place to be. This is the ark. If it were, you know, we see that it's starting to rain and we see the ark. So we'd like to go in there, please. But, you know, then, you know, there's all the other stuff that comes with it. So, well, I think last week, you know, or the week, week before when father was talking about um, the sort of the, the demons always being there and always being at full strength. And that it's just the fact that God is like put up when we were talking about the, I am legend, like the, mm -hmm. the glass shield. And, and mm -hmm. I think that it's like, that's the thing about the question of, is it ramping up? It's like the demons only have one speed. Like it's mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're fully ramped up. They've always been fully ramped mm -hmm. up. The fact that you're not experiencing mm -hmm. their full wrath is not because they're not, coming with full wrath at you it's just because they're being blocked by something and it's mm -hmm, like that right. you know for whatever reason that like you were saying father that it's like god has decided okay i'm gonna lift that glass up a little bit for the sake of your repentance so that you can move a little fast experience mm -hmm. a little bit of this wrath and move a little faster mm -hmm. that's what it, yep. that's what i'm yep. absolutely feeling yeah mm -hmm. father what would you what would you and so the surge that we're talking about, just I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. The surge that we're talking about is what some parishes have talked about, that they're just seeing incredible numbers of people coming in and wanting, you know, to be catechized and stuff like that. Um, if someone what what are like some of the things I'm really just trying to think of something to ask because that's my job. But is what would you think someone what would be like a common hang up? that you think that someone who's coming in as a response to what they saw in 2020, what are some of the hangups that you see a lot, Father? Well, 
I think that there's a patience problem. I think sometimes, like, at least for me, you know, um, I've had a couple of times where I've had to just let people know right off the bat, it's like you're looking at the bare minimum of a year, you know, um, and I think they have a, I think they have thoughts. Some people have thoughts sometimes that, you know, well, I've read, I've seen stuff online and this and that, and I'm ready to go. Um, and with that is, you know, understanding it's like, okay, like lifestyle, you know, um, lifestyles, like everything. It, it's more important that you have praxis than it is that you have information, you know, and mm -hmm. just trying to get people to understand that is, is a little bit of the hang up. Um, I, I think that, you know, our context is a little different um, because thanks be to God, you know, the exposure through, you know, the internet has helped my job as a priest a, a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, there's people who come, obviously they, they kind of more and more, they know who I am, meaning they kind of know my approach to things. So when they see me trying to, get them to really come to Christ or kind of slow them down. They're kind of expecting that, you know, and it's been good because I've had some people reach out to me and they're like, I got received too fast. And I, those people I have a lot of respect for, and I have a lot of hope for people who have that sense where they're just like, I feel like I got received too fast. What should I do? Because those are people who are trying to be sober and, and take it, you know, um, take it seriously. Um, but I, I think the reality is, is that, there's a lot of people too who one of their hangups may be they need to hang to the side their expectations. You know, so if you've been watching, you know, fill in the bre fill in the blank priest, and then you get to your parish and you know, Father Jimmy, you know, isn't kind of really doing it for you, you know, you got I think I think people are starting to figure out it's like, well. I just got to kind of get in and, and, that, and do my best where I'm at, you know? Is that Jimmy of Jerusalem? But yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I should be Father name? Bob. Father Bob, you know? Father so Bob of, Father of, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Father Bob of Bakersfield. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it, it's just, it's a matter of maturity. I think it is a big part of it. Um but for the most part, you know, I think, listen, I can say from experience, one thing that can bug some people, but I think it's a good thing. I would have much rather have catechumens or people who are inquirers that are coming with some information than none. Because I'll tell you why. It's a lot easier then to kind of circumvent certain things and just kind of start hammering them on their passions and hammering them on like, okay, it's great. You know this, but like, if you know this, then you realize then this is what you are. And then they can kind of start accepting that a little bit more versus like when I came into the church, a lot of people, you know, this is, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of people didn't even know about passions, depending on what jurisdiction you got brought into until they were like Orthodox for like five, seven, 10 years sometimes. Right. They didn't even know about passions. They didn't even know about napsis. They didn't know about these things. They didn't know about living the spiritual life. They were just, you know, kind of learning the very basics of praxis, maybe fasting. Um, and to be frank, that was okay then, but I think because of everything we've been talking about, people said it's, you know, kind of it's not like time is short in the sense of it's well, you know, St. Sarah from Rose, it's later than you think. It's later but, than you think. But, but yeah. I think in a, in a it, 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 I think in a sober sense, people are realizing, yeah, I, I really kind of want to start living my living my life in a way that I, if it's possible, I'm more ready to die than not. Like a lot of people when they're joining the church in the early 2000s when when we joined the church, and they really weren't thinking about that. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, I talked to a lot of people that were thinking about that. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing. And I, I do think that is a good reason to convert. I think it's a way better reason to convert than wanting to have moral purity for your nation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Um, 
not that moral purity for nations is a bad thing. It's just it's a fool's errand. You're not going to happen, right? So, um, yeah, I I think that the biggest thing to kind of put a period on your question, Andrew. I think the biggest thing is is getting people to really let go of the things that are tough for us as Americans, right? Because you can be orthodox and all stuff, but it's still when someone calls you out of your stuff, you know, I don't care how much, I don't care how much St. Joseph that has a cast you've read, unless you've gone through it, it's hard when someone tells you, hey, man, um, you need to take a step back. You know, you're, you're deluded. Or, hey, you know, you don't really know what you're talking about. And just listen to what I'm telling you. That's still hard for people. You know what I mean? And so if they can, if they can work through that, you know, I think that's the thing. I, I have a follow-up question. But because before, I, before the praise, I was going to chime in and say, like, yeah, I was definitely brought into the church too quickly. And that was partly on me because I was kind of fibbing a little bit to my priest at the time to be like, mm-hmm. no, 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 everything's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm okay. Things are all right. Because I was just trying to get in there. I was just, yeah. You know, no fault to the baptizing priest. I, I was kind of fi- finding the right. Th- I'm very good at finding the right things to say. So mm-hmm. I, I found the right things to say. And um, what what would you say to a person like me? That would be like, you know, I, I don't know if there's any long lasting spiritual damage, but to a, someone who was brought in, maybe because I mean, I was even thinking about this, like, again, no fault to my priest. I'm not trying to throw anyone into the bus, but I was like saying pre-communion prayers for them and stuff like that. Like I was taking turns and maybe the situation warranted it. But that's some of the stuff now where I'm like, I don't, I don't like, you know, like, um, like pre-communion prayers, like, you know, before, uh matins and stuff like that it was like so i was thinking like maybe that was totally like not good of me to do that like i don't know if i should have been doing that and like now especially like i i I don't know but like at our parish we're doing the whole it seems like some catechumens are trying pretty hard to depart when they're supposed to depart like they they take off when they're supposed to and um you know that yeah but even that but but that's a great point because i just had a conversation with some catechumens about that and i was like they ask for a blessing, and I say, yeah, you could do that, but you just got to watch it. Like, oh, it's like, yeah, because I'm like, that's a quick way to pride. <clears throat> because oh. it's like you're taking it upon yourself to be like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it the right way and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, mm. you know, it's, it's one of those things where this is – I'm glad you brought this up because this is the big thing because it's like one of the things that was revealed – through the pandemic was like, okay, okay, who's traditional, who's not? That's like, we can kind of talk in these terms, right? But again, this project is, I know plenty of people are quote unquote traditional and they're not really like close to Christ. You know, it's like, they don't have love for people. They don't, you know what I mean? Their prayers are just like, they're spouting words and you can tell it when you're around them. You know what I mean? Let's just, you know, bring on the hate mail, let's go. So I've just, this has been my experience and this is why, you know, I just feel like this is one of those hills I'll die on because, you know, again, you know, say several rows, like hyper correctness is, is a problem and it's a problem now, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a problem. It's a, that's one of the reasons why we did this project, right? Because there's people, you know, it's those, that's one of the things that is a true marker in regards to the stereotype of ortho bro stuff is the hyper correctness where it's just like, you know, you may be doing all these things, but you you don't have the love of God in you. And you are very quickly on a road towards, you know, a very hellish existence if you don't find some humility and some obedience, right? Um, because you'll become a monster, right? Mm-hmm. That's a real thing. Mm-hmm. Like, that's... That, in fact, that's why I even started talking in the first place, because way back when, you know, shout out to Michael Whitcoff, Brother Augustine, that's why I first went on with him, was to be like, okay, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what I see, because I got love, right? I got love, and I got the chops, meaning I got people in my life who were coming from these backgrounds. I have, you know, godchildren and friends who are, you know, flirting with white supremacy, so... 
I got no problem talking about it. You know what I mean? And to act like that's not a thing is baloney. And, you know, there's, it's funny. I was talking with John Hears about this today. Like there, there's a, tr there's a nugget of truth in all of it. There's a nugget of truth in wokeism. There's a nugget of truth in Nazism. There's a nugget. That's how the devil hooks you. Right. And so what I'm saying, what we've been trying to say is, okay, I see the nugget of truth of why you feel disenfranchised, you know, 28 to 34 year old single white male. And you see these things. I get it. But the thing is, is you've got to realize that the, your part, your part of the pie, your piece of the story isn't the whole story, especially when we're talking about Christ. So you got to walk back that distortion. Are you following me so far? Yes, right? absolutely. So, absolutely. So, so that being said, you know, it's like, that's why this hyper correctness, it's like, Hey, uh, scandal, scandal. You want to, you want to get a good little bit of praxis and humility to take it out of the abstract, eat a small piece of cheese on Wednesday and Friday, you know, mm -hmm. just be like, okay, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're fasting perfect. Right. You know, something like that. So like, yeah, catechumens depart. I, I remember being a platina, you know what I mean? Uh, being a platina and doing that whole thing, you know, like I get it, but down the road, the better thing is, yeah, you know what? Don't try to be better than the priest. Don't try to be better than the people that have been in the church, you know, longer than you've been alive. Just relax a little bit, right? And do that because it is time to discern some things, right? But don't don't lose the forest for the trees. Don't lose Christ for the sake of your being. I'm better than you, and that's what and that's what can happen, right? That's what can happen is you're being obedient in something that's a little bit of you know, yeah. It may not be the most you know traditional way to do something, but if you're being obedient, you'll that'll gain you grace in the favor of God a lot quicker than you being like, oh, the priest doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm taking off during the catechumen verse. You know what I mean? Like that, mm. that's real important to kind of understand because that's a temptation for lots of people it because just, you can. I'm so sorry. It just hit me. It's just like, man, like God is just doing everything he can to save you. Yep. He's just yep. doing yeah. everything. He's like yep. every olive branch Every yeah. like first step yeah. taken, like yeah. every road repaired. Yeah. It's and he like, does everything. And forgive me, Andrew, I have to cut you off. No, no, no. Because I want to say it's one of the things that I was meaning to say and you brought me back, which is, and the one thing that I'm, excuse me, okay with, and I thank, I thank God for it. You know, at, at this point in my life, I've seen enough people fall into delusion and real delusion. Like real, real prelates, like not just like you know, of our job. That's what he's talking about. I got plenty of those people, I, and I thank God for them. I'm talking, you know, people who have. You're one step. Yeah, you're one step away from being interned, like that type of stuff, right? I've seen it. I see people leave. I know people have left. Who you know, unless God works a miracle, but they're not coming back. I, uh, so this is what I'm talking about, and and. I can say all that to say I got peace as a priest. Um, I worry about people. I worry about the flock of Christ, my flock, the flock of Christ. But I see over and over again where God arranges crisis just so with such accuracy, like a surgeon. And I don't need to do it. I don't need to create the crisis for someone. God does it. He allows that to come to the surface. I see it over and over again where it's just like, wow, God really loves this person. He's allowed them to come to this very painful place. And that, that is not a trope. I'm not trying to like stereotype or caricature myself. I'm just telling you, I see it all the time. And to me, that gives me so much peace because God has a way of allowing you to fall flat on your face in the mud. And it's, and that's the love of God. And if you're willing to see it for what it is, man, you come back real humble, but real close to the Lord if you can look it through those things. Because that's his that's his hand. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean Father, it's the it's the pattern. I mean, even even materialist atheists when they're talking about like addiction, I mean it's the pattern of rock bottom. 
to where it's mm-hmm. like, well, this person, they really got to hit rock bottom or else they're not going to be safe from this. They're mm-hmm. either going to hit rock bottom or they're going to die. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, that's the order. Because it's a spiritual yeah. crisis, obviously. Yeah. I mean, addiction is a purely spiritual thing. Yeah. You know what? I, it, of course, it turns into the physical because mm-hmm. the the spiritual is not outside. It's got the but the physical is the symptom. The physical is the symptom mm-hmm. of yeah, the spiritual. Right, right. And so it's like that pattern is like that is or nobody can deny that that's order. Right. That it's like this crisis is for the the ultimate crisis because rock bottom is the ultimate crisis. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. like rock bottom and then death. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's the ultimate crisis before death. And it's like that's the fact that that is the order, the mm-hmm. actual order that nobody can mm-hmm. deny is like, well, mm-hmm. then, of course, this crisis must be for my benefit. Mm-hmm. And that and that's one of the interesting things is that people don't realize that's the not that's not only just the order of everything, but that's the call. Because everyone's going to face the ultimate humiliation, which is death. Like, listen, at some point in time, your faculties leave you. We've talked about this before. And the process of dying for everyone, whether you die in a slow death of cancer or you die a quick death of being shot in the back, right? Everyone has the awareness of the loss of their faculty to whatever degree. And that powerlessness and the terror that overcomes someone, even if it's a split second, right? That's something that God's allowed for the ultimate humbling of all of us. Every knee shall bow. So the mortal coil being humbled in such a way is a profound spiritual experience that everyone will have, but only those who prepared for it is it salvific. Only for those who have prepared for it is it redemptive. Those who have not prepared for it, mm, <laughs> you yeah. know? Hmm. Is it well, the, I think that this is when you when you when you brought up I, I was going to say, because when you brought up this this notion of the the people who seem to be the most prepared to undergo the the journey and the transformation willingly seem to be those whose minds are on death. And I think that going back to this idea of what changed, that's really what changed. Mm-hmm. Was it like here we are in early 2020 mm-hmm. and it's like every power on all sides of the equation was saying to everybody, think of nothing but your death. Mm -hmm. Spend all day, every day, thinking of nothing Mm -hmm. but your death and the death Mm -hmm. of everyone around you. All Mm -hmm. day, every day. And it's like, Mm -hmm. well, what's your response to that? Mm -hmm. And I think that first, it's like, well, if you're really looking to deal with that, It's going to, you're going to be looking into the mystical. You're going to be looking into, you're going to have a spiritual crisis Mm -hmm. over that. And and you see, you see the people who are quote unquote in the church, you know, and God bless them. Like we all, you know, we're not Donatists, right? It's like, okay, people can repent and God God bless the ones who repent. But you see where people fell into the thing of like, I don't want to think about that. I want to think about safety and security and how to save, how to save everybody and this and that. And it's like, "Mm, mm," you know, (laughs) <laughs> and I don't think I don't I th- think that's the way this is supposed to go, you know? I, I think, think you're supposed to be like, okay, we're gonna die. Go ahead, sorry. No, no. Well, Cyprian, I think that um I was about to go somewhere different with what you said was I think maybe some of the responses because I remember at a certain point it started to get clownish, but I think you're absolutely correct. And I think everything that you said is correct. What I what I would have taken away from that if I had been in the frame of mind that I might have been in in a different reality, whatever, I wasn't in the church yet. I wasn't repenting of the, some of the things I needed to repent when that whole thing happened was like, wow, everyone is so terrified of death. Like, and it's kind of a joke. Like, look at how much um, I know we've talked about it before, only because it's one of my favorite, absolute favorite uh, analysis of the way people handle death, but the mask of the red death by Edgar Allan Poe. Mm. One, basically when it, at the chiming of every hour, they're all in a castle because there's a plague and the rich people have decided, well, we're going to not worry about it. And we're just going to sit and we're going to party all day long. And, um, and every time the clock chimes, everybody stops what they're doing and just like stares at the clock until it's done chiming. And then they all like laugh and like, Oh, well we won't do that next time. Like that's ridiculous. And then it happens again. 
And there's only so many times that that can happen before somebody from the crowd is just like, if they're in their right mind or whatever, and they would say like, why do we keep doing this? Like, why is everyone so terrified of this thing? Of Like, why are we all losing our minds over the possibility that this thing that we all know is going to happen might happen sooner than we thought? And like, what? If, and then I would just at that point, imaginary Andrew too from an alternate reality would just be like, this is clown school. Like you guys are clown school. Like everything that we've done, I'm just seeing it as like to like hold up this like um, artifice of immortality of like this, like, well, what can we do so that you don't have to think about death anymore and just concentrate on like having fun all the time. And I, it's like, I think that that might've been the reaction to some people That's all I was going to say is like, it just struck me as like, wow, that would be, to me, that would be a big unveiling of like, Oh, everyone is terrified of this. And shocker, the powers that be mm -hmm. have no clue what to do about it. Like it, they're still powerless before death. Like they can't, they cannot stop That's that. Right. Like they can maybe postpone life a little bit, you know. But I mean, no, and no physician is walking into a doctor's office and the person's dying is like, you need more time. I give you ten more years. Like Christ right. has done to <laughs> countless saints just being like, you want right. to be here a little bit longer. I'll give you five more years. That's fine. No physician right. has ever done that. So it's like, right. Yeah. That that's, except that's what great, I'm taking away from that. But except the great physician. Well, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The capital and Hezekiah, and, Hezekiah, the 15 years, you know, weeping before the Lord. And the Lord says, I give you 15 more years. I hear your cries. I give you 15 more years, you know? So, man, yeah, just clown school, but but this is I think that that was I mean, even early on, that was what was very much revealed to me is is that and it, and I think that it I think it really is in many ways. I think, Andrew, you've actually identified a generational difference, right? Because I, I this is one of the things that certainly my parents generation, right, like the the baby boomer generation, I think that like. If you if you look at the the overall sort of narrative, particularly of their youth and even into their adulthood and even into their you know middle age, was and still people like Ray Kurzweil, who are of that generation, is that there was always this underlying idea underneath it that like immortality might be possible. We mm. might just figure this out in our lifetime. We might figure out this immortality thing. Like there was, it was always there like, oh, maybe, maybe we could live forever. Maybe we is really that, could. Is that like a response to the amount of death that just happened? Like, do you think that that, because that's, that's the first time. No, I think it's, I think it's a response to a leap in technology. Okay. Like the movement into the nuclear age. And like, I think it's just this response to this incredible increase in abundance and like, and actually the ability to heal a lot of things like that couldn't be quote unquote healed with like, with, with medicine. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what's interesting about that though is, did you guys catch the Tuck uh, Rogan? Interview? I haven't watched it all. I haven't watched it all. No. Yeah. The first 30 minutes is really, you know, kind of the fire, but it, there's some good stuff in there. But he has this great point where he starts talking about, you know, the kind of mindset, the paradigm that Joe Rogan has, you know, the kind of evolutionary scientism, sprinkling a bit of new age, hippy dippy, which is basically Joe Rogan, right? And my man Tuck, he's like, yeah, you know, everybody pretty much believed in the spiritual powers up until uh, the nuclear bomb. And something something happened with the dropping of the nuclear bomb where it's just like, you know, that kind of went away and people started thinking about scientism and all this stuff. And I find it fascinating because, interestingly enough, to kind of correlate with what, you know, you're saying, Cipri, and it's like, there's a weird, I don't know what the phrase would be, but there's this like weird illusion that, if this makes sense, um, Forgive the roundabout way. You know how like Amish in some ways are so, you know, like as Orthodox, you can look at the Amish and like kind of tip the hat a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Well, traditional. They're traditional. The traditional, 
But, you know, the Amish are so anti-sacramental. They're like Anabaptists. They're like, do you remember in Pac-Man? Right, forgive me. You remember in Pac-Man where it's like you go on this end and then like you come out and then you come back over here. You know what I'm talking about? It's like you go so far to one end of the spectrum, you come out on the other end. Does that make sense? I see the Amish like that yes. sense of their, their anti-sacramentalism is so off the chain that they end up kind of being closer to the Orthodox in some ways than, right? Does that make sense? So the nihilism- It does, it does, yeah. So the nihilism that was brought about through the, through the you know, the atomic age and all that stuff and, and the baby boomers coming to rise, it's like that nihilism kind of like, like scared them stupid into this really weird utopianistic atheism, the scientism. Does this, are you follow what I'm saying? This is a, this is a probably a bad analysis, but I see that because this, it's not a love of God and it's not a hope of immortality that everyone had prior to the dropping of the bomb. It's, it's, it's a hope of immortality through the means of science and through the, through our own means, you know what I mean? And through, enlightenment you know quote unquote and i find that really interesting because now you're seeing this weird space where because of and and there's a whole thing we could go there in regards of covidism actually being intentional to some degree one of the intentional fruits of it is to dismantle scientism intentionally to bring about a proper um kind of like theistic paradigm not for Christians, but for the Antichrist. You know, a proper. I understand exactly paradigm. where you're going. I understand exactly you know I mean? where you're going with that. And mm -hmm. Because because bricklayers, bricklayers, and other people look at atheists as idiots. You know what I mean? Because they realize that the the problem isn't the problem is is who is who's really right. You know what I'm saying? Well, forget forgive me, Father. The bricklayers won't let you in if you're an atheist, specifically. Right. You right. must believe in God. That is a prerequisite right. to becoming right. one. Right. Right. That, oh. so, but do you see what I'm saying about the whole, you know, out one end, you come in the other? You know, it's it's interesting to me. It's interesting. Well, I, I mean, my thought would be, I mean, and who's real? I mean, at the end of the day, who's really here for Andrew's thoughts so much? But my thought would be about the the dropping. More people than you think, maybe. But the um, with the dropping of the atomic bomb, and it's interesting. Have you guys ever heard the theory that the atomic bomb's not real? Like that? I've never heard that. Yeah, that it was fire. <clears throat> Hiroshima and Nagasaki were fire bombed, and everything else has been just a crap ton of regular bombs that are just ignited a certain way. But the atomic hmm. bomb's not real. Anyway, I have no idea because it seems like one of the most well is atomic energy is our atomic. So what? So what? A nuclear power plant's running on. Look, Cyprian, I'm not saying that I believe this. <laughs> I don't. I have no idea. I'm just saying that it is out there that there are people who believe that the atomic bomb is not real. There's like three people in our audience right now being like, "No, he no." There's some. There's some data. There's some data. But the um, I just think that. I mean, I don't know. And maybe this is the generational difference that Cyprian was talking about, uh, but through a different lens that like you just you don't walk away because that's I would say without having like any of the numbers in front of me that that's the most amount of people killed instantly in all of world history. Um, you know, unless there's some weird campaign that happened during like the some war from like 5000 where they managed to wipe out a whole city of 200,000 people at one time. I have no idea. I don't think Yeah, but so. it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened that fast. It would just a be vaporization. impossible to do it that fast. Yeah, to the you point where shadows are yeah. seeing catching no. like the atomic shadows to catch. So no, ab absolutely. And I think that that was what that was what that shifted everything. Where people were like, "Oh, we have this power now." Was basically what they felt. Well, that was Oppenheimer, right? Where he likes, uh, "I, I have mm -hmm. become death destroyer of worlds." Right. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That it's like godlike power. Yeah. Well, quoting a demon. Quoting a demon, yes. like, and yes. so, um, so the, the way my view on that would be like, okay, well then how far does this go back where we, it's like, okay, now, and then you have the next 40 years of living under constant threat 
of this happening mm -hmm. to you, of it happening to the entire world, that's going to put death in this place that it's never really been before, which, you know, so there's a part in the Watchmen where it's, it's, um, it's a history, but it goes a slightly different direction in which their God, the God like being, uh, Dr. Manhattan wins Vietnam and the one of the uh, one of the heroes comedian is talking to Dr. Manhattan and he's basically said, I don't know what would have happened to us as a country if we had lost this war. If we had lost Vietnam, it might have driven us completely crazy. And it's like, OK, so then take take that a little bit. And it's like, OK, on some level you recognize because I remember feeling this as a kid. You are part of a country that has like committed the largest simultaneous instant murder of all time and not only that but since there is some kind of like level of well it's going to come back to you at some point as a citizen of the united states of america mm -hmm. and especially reinforced by the cold war that took place between the ussr mm -hmm. and america that it puts death in this like suddenly there's like it's in this whole different space because not only that but you have this possibility of like, well, I might not have to experience death, but also death is here to create this like spiritual schizophrenia, which I mean, could have just really manifested in 2020. I'm not sure. That's not really like revealed or like revealed in a way that was hadn't been revealed before. But when the boomers experienced growing up, hearing the tale of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or in some cases being alive for it and then, you know, seeing about it live real time or whatever, it, it, there's just this no way you you would have to go insane you just on some level it would break you as a human being to know that on some level like this happened in our world and uh well it did well it did the 1960s did yeah yeah so that's what like I'm it, saying. it did that's a bro that's that's the break right there that's a skit that's a schizophrenic break of a generation if there's ever been one and i think that's really important because still to this day for as many people have done the analysis and all the stuff, and even like, yeah, the three letter agencies facilitating the stuff. The reality of it is, is looking back on counterculture. I don't, th I just, I don't think people understand how, how much of a deviant move it was. You know what I mean? And not even like from, you know, Beaver Cleaver, 1950s morality, but just like think of us as Christians, you know, the deviation of counterculture, you know, starting from like the sixties and, 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 and moving on. It's, it's, it's huge. It's well, for, huge. forgive me, father. It's, it's, it was absolutely unprecedented in human history. I did a, I did a video about this called the consensus crisis. Like people don't think about the fact that like for all of human history up until that point, your life was pretty much the same and your beliefs as a as a whole as a generation mm -hmm. first mm -hmm. off generations didn't even really exist your beliefs and your life was pretty much the same as like your great great grandfather's life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you ate the same food you listened to the same music you lived in the same kind of house you had the same kind of job you did all of that and that was the tr that was true for like mm -hmm. all of humanity up until mm -hmm. this one moment when like yeah. parents didn't understand their children anymore yeah and i just want to start any level to I want to stop real quick because I think I want I need to make a real important distinction to to prove your point, which hopefully someone out there is thinking this. What you're saying is absolutely true, because although the 20s were absolutely morally corrupt and decadent, and like if you if you look at the 20s, you could be like, "Whoa, this is," you know what I mean? And yeah, even the fascination with the de even the fascination with the devil and all that that popped up in the twenties, like, yes, that's all there. But what you're saying is really pertinent from my perspective because it's that break is the thing, and the ability which started in the twenties with like the World um, Fair and and the 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 beginning roots of Hinduism. And yoga practices coming to the World Fair, like that's a thing, but you don't see it breaking, being unleashed like Pandora's box until, until the dropout stuff. Do you, does, do you, are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, that distinction is huge because it isn't just simply like, yeah, because people have been 
having sex and drinking and the flappers like that. Okay. Whatever. This is, this was something different. The, the inability to communicate the inability for any social cohesion, that is what changed. Right. That fundamental fissure. Forget and, 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 and what's interesting is out. we now take it for granted. Like mm. we take it for granted that like, Oh, eventually I'm not going to understand my children anymore. Mm -hmm. This was not before the sixties. This was not like the, the parents of the boomers to them. This was, they, they had, they had no frame of reference for the idea that they wouldn't understand their children. True madness. Yeah. They were like, what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. What is happening? Because it had never happened before, but now we just assume, Oh yeah, I'm not going to understand. Eventually you know, I'm not going to understand my children and I'm just going to be an old fuddy duddy. And all of the rules that I lived in my life will no longer apply to my children. And think about what a control mechanism that is for the powers to just be like, oh, yeah, that's true, by the way. Serpent slithering along like, mm -hmm. oh, guess what? All the rules that your parents laid out, they are not going to apply mm -hmm. to you. That's what the wokes are. Yeah, that's well, what the wokes are. Well, I mean, the thing is, is forgive me and, and Timothy, St. Paul perfectly the others in the last days. Men will be disobedient to parents. You know what I mean? And that it's a huge, huge thing that people don't look at, you know, which is why the not conservative, but the preservative aspect in the church is so powerful. Ooh, ooh. Oh, I'm gonna start saying that. I'm not a conservative, I'm a preservative. Yeah, 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 because that that is coming from a spirit of generosity, right? Knowing that God in his abundance is like, yeah, I mean, this is this is what gives life. Because conserving has a sense of like, you know, scarcity and hoarding and like, go away, you can't have this, you know, there's not enough for you and me, where salt preserves. Yeah. Right? And so the the life in the church preserves you know what what gives life what gives life and there's plenty of it but no one wants to come and eat at the banquet you know um i i don't mean to keep hammering home i'm not trying to be profound but is is it isn't it like <laughs> um it to go back to the thing i just realized that you had your father you brought up the 1920s mm -hmm. the world's fair and then the um the counterculture i'm just saying isn't that kind of weird that both these events take place right after a world war i mean like like you have your world war one trauma and, yeah i mean yeah i don't know i think it's just probably one of those things it's like okay well god really knew what he was doing when he was separating the nations probably because he knew the effect that a world war would have on humanity mm. i'm just saying mm -hmm. i don't know and what and what that opens up. So that's well, sp that's speaking of, speaking of this, I, this is something that I, I want to talk about. And since we've got a, a few minutes, it, and since it happened last week, I think it's topical. One of the things that I noticed, and even in my own home, and my wife and I had to have a long discussion about it actually, because she's she's a very sensitive person, and what's happening in, to the Palestinians, the children and women in particular, has really yeah. affected her over this time. I mean, it's really, you know, I mean, she's, it, it's, it's brought her way more to deeper prayer, I think, but um, it's really affected her. And when this thing happened with Iran striking Israel, there was a, 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 a sense of like, she had a sense of like positive kind of like just justice or something toward it like uh, finally mm -hmm. somebody's doing something and we had to i had to like stop you know with her and we had to sit down and really like talk it through about like we don't we don't want a world war like there's no there's no, there's not no reason no matter for whatever reason like there's nothing good about a world war like nothing good can come from a world war but it was incredible to me seeing like the overall bloodthirstiness of so many people, whether it was by like 
maliciousness or just like default or a want for novelty or entertainment or like this is a show or something like that to where like that whole experience and then people being like Israel needs to like respond like crazy and people even if they were against Israel being like I hope Israel responds so that they get nuked and and I was like whoa yeah like this is you're summoning like you're it's a mass demon summoning yeah it's a mass demon summoning I'm yeah. like, what are you, why are you summoning this? That's thing? exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's like, uh, you know, I don't know, episode 29, whatever, I was talking about that one Justice League episode with the mm. with Hades, and he's got the, 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 the Cosmiacs and the, the Borgeracs, and they're fighting, and he's playing both sides, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and again, like, like, you know, not to be self aware, but that. That's like another reason why we do our, our project is because that's the harder thing. First of all, it's the truth, stand by it. But it's the harder it, it because it because it is the truth. It's the harder thing to stand by. The easier thing is to pick your side and to do whatever. Um, and that's one of the things I appreciated about Tuck's commentary on the Rogan thing because he's like, yeah, I, I'm I'm I love my country, American, blah blah blah. But he's like, you know, uh, war is terrible, and I know. I don't want a world war, you know, something to the same effect, you know, Santa Fronti says it's the greatest of sins is, is war, you know, but yeah, it's, and this is why, I don't know, maybe again, I would just, if I was to add something to like the kind of talking points of what we're always trying to say in our project, I would say, hey, man, it's really time for, for people to have prayer and and sobriety. Like when you're at liturgy, people, you know, audience, you guys are at liturgy and we're praying the litanies for peace Mm. and for the government and all that. Don't just be like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's time for you to really pray and to make your cross and to really be asking God, because that's what we're doing. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's going to be Biden, Trump, you know, boogaloo, whoever, like we're praying for God to have mercy on us. Cause like we are the aliens, no matter where you're at as Christians, no matter what your country is, you're, you're an alien, right? This is the epistle to Diogenes. So you need to be praying during the litanies when the deacon or the priest is, is imploring God for peace because we need it now, because the reality is, is that, um, <clears throat> the the loss of life, and I'm not talking about limb. I'm talking about people getting their life sucked out of them through this bloodthirst. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. It's sure. it's it is it's it's epidemic levels. You know what I mean? You're seeing people on either side. You know, it's like, and it's the chaos is just fomenting. You don't know who's who, what's what. Um, and no, you're not going to know unless you're actually rooted in Christ. Um, and the reality of the atrocities, like I was just watching a thing last night on um, how many people know about the insanity of what's happening um, in Darfur right now. Like there, it's just. There's a civil yeah. war, right? There's a, some sort of a civil war. Yeah, huge. It's like huge, like to this huge epidemic level. No one's talking about it, but it's it's like I saw this thing there. It's he framed it really well, especially after watching this guy's analysis. It's like this is the proxy war that no one's talking about because all these powers are getting involved in there, and it's like just the numbers of casualties and what you say. It's just staggering, and no one says it, anything about it. Even even African. Um, News outlets don't cover it because of the reality of, of people know, you know, how sensitive and they're seeing everyone proxy. It's, it's the proxy war stuff, you know, where everyone's focused on what's happening with Israel and Palestine and Ukraine and Russia. This is happening and, and all those players are involved here as well. And it's just it it's it's almost like that is a bigger sign of the powder keg than anything else, because you start seeing that it isn't just the surface level of we're fighting over territory. And so that's like, no, no, no. The proxies are 
gearing up for this world conflict, you know, and it's. Well, you know, father, we, I think we, that as, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the big things, forgive me. One of the big things about all of this is like all of the conflicts that you mentioned, this is not about, it's not about territory. Mm -hmm. Like it's all spiritual. In mm -hmm. one way or another, it's mm -hmm. all spiritual. It's not. It's not about gaining resources because there could be an argument that World War One and World War Two were like resource driven. You know what I mean? There could be every. It's always spiritual, but there could be this argument that it's like, sure. oh, the great powers vying to try to get resources and stuff. It's none of that now. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. None of this is about any of that now. Mm -mm. No, no, and I think the thing too is, and again. Forgive me for referencing it because, you know, it's like I, I think I, we were talking about this, you know, Tuck, one of his biggest problems, he's a, he's a man, he's a modern man. He doesn't understand the ancient world. We talked about that, right? But in light of that, his analysis is great in this interview, too, because one of the things that people are kind of missing is that, um, you know, the, the powers that be are all characterized by this absolute bold-faced, nonstop lying and corruption. And he has a good little segment on it. And it's like, I think that's one of the things getting back to the people waking up and wanting to come to the church is they saw death, but also people are just like, I can't take, I can't take being lied to. It's like people are seeing the lying so much ministry of his, you know, truth. It's just like people are looking for some real truth to just not go insane. Yeah, you know, and the absolute lies that are just fomented on such a just a maddening, sickening, insane level by all governments now and by all, you know, NGOs. It's like it's crazy. It's crazy, you know. And this is I mean, oh, I'm so sorry. If go ahead. Go. Sorry, Andrew. Go, please. No, no, no. NGO. The non-governmental organization. Okay, I don't know if I know what that is. They're like in they they they're people would say that they're charities, but that's not really what they are. They're okay. like power. They're power centers. They're like usually nonprofits. So it's like they're not in it for profit. They're in it for it's really power. It's a way for certain groups to exercise a lot power of. In forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me, Supreme. I mentioned it because the best way even to explain what you're saying, Zipri, is most of how Bill Gates has gotten power in the world is through NGOs. Okay. So they're like they're like a they're they're powers. Okay. You know what I mean, so principalities are governments, but powers are NGOs. Okay. Because in in this context, if we're going to use this, NGOs have greater influence than a lot of principalities. Like NGOs move way more than than a national government does. So, it does but, but you by but by the way you also can't see them that's and, the most and, important part right. about ngos that's the you most cannot right. see them you you right. think that, that it's the principality moving but it's right. the power moving right and this it and this analysis this where we're going with this is really important for people to understand because to be a little bit more kind of explicit one of the things people enjoy, right, kind of breaking the fourth wall about what we do is, you know, it's just we try to really see the whole picture collectively. It isn't just like the religious aspect of orthodoxy. It's like it's it has to be nestled in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can only talk about whatever so long before you're just LARPing. You know what I mean? Sure. And so the thing is, is just to give everybody an insight into it, right? right? This is the real symbolic thinking that you need to worry about is you need to begin to get the language that St. Paul used in the Epistle of Ephesians and, the, and throughout the whole New Testament and understand the worldview, right? And, and beyond the worldview, again, of just LARPing, you need to understand these things, right, to discern because the, what Cyprian just said is really key if you understand it. The principalities would be analogous and are analogous to, to national governments, but the powers of these NGOs, which you cannot and do not see. And this is really important because this is fractals, right? The macro is also how the micro works because the devil working in someone's life isn't always just like your porn addiction and like your gluttony. It's actually 
actually these other areas of envy and manipulation, these other things that you do that no one really sees or the devil really has rights on you, right? Because I can get you off of cigarettes and meth, you know? I've done it before, just as, not even as, like, as a priest, but as like a counselor, like I can help you do that. But the thing where it really takes Christ's help is to get you to see your envy, to see your manipulation, to see those things, those soft skills, mm. which are super, super hidden. And that's where the real power lies. Your, your uh, left-handed issues of just like your gross physical sins are just really the symptom and, the, and nowhere near the problem of the other ones, which are like I just described. So those NGOs, that's like the micro of that and the macro of that would be, um, well, you get what I'm saying. You, yeah, you flip it, know. Right? Like that's, that's actually pretty enlightening because I think that, um, and the second part of uh, why big oil conquered or how big oil conquered the world. And then there's yeah. the second part, yeah. like why big oil conquered the world. Now I'm starting to understand some of the stuff that they were mm -hmm. talking about a little bit more. Oh, Rockef Rockefeller and yeah. Carnegie, basically, they were the ones who absolutely figured out this, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Foundation. I mean, these are, then the interesting, it, it's, it's funny that we're talking about this now, because when we started, Father, the things that I was talking about being revealed, of seeing like mm -hmm. powers and things. Yeah. Well, here... Here, NGO, because this is like NGO country. It's the vacuum mm -hmm. power area, right? And it's like, oftentimes here there will be, it's been fascinating because I'll see, I'll see things and I'll see that like, it literally is power to where you're like, wait a minute, the system, you look at the system and how it's, how everybody thinks that it works. And then something will happen. There'll be a blockage or something that doesn't move. And there's a person over mm -hmm. here and you're like, what is this person? Yeah. Like, what is their, I don't understand. What is this person's position? And there's been, a, there are a few of these people here who have immense power beyond, yeah. like literally yeah. there's, there's one or two guys here who can stop a bill from getting introduced into Congress. And you're like, wait a minute. How, what is their position? And their position is like this small little thing. And my wife and stuff have talked about it and been like, is this guy CIA? Like months ago, is this guy CIA? Mm. Like, what is this thing? And it's like, it's that. But what I've come, to, but again, it's like, it's why, you know, St. Paul and like what he's talking about in Ephesians. And funny enough, the first, how our relationship began, Father, the first thing is you were like, you got to listen to this talk, Powers and Principalities, because it's going to be important. And mm. it is that to where you're like, to really understand what power looks like and mm -hmm. to understand that it's not about a title or any of these things that it's like, no, no, no. I, you can identify the power. And then what's interesting is when you go and start to look, you can see that there's this long line of these little serpentine actions that look so innocuous that you could mm -hmm. see had been planned over a long period of time that have wound up with this position being so powerful and nobody's paying attention to it. Yeah. Isn't that kind yeah. of how the American presidency ended up where it is now? Oh, Maybe dude, out of one... there's st there still is a lot of power in the American presidency. But when you get into these places like in the third world, like that power has th those presidents have no power and it's all in the hands of NGOs. And it's little appointed people within the government where the NGO is like, oh, we'll provide you with this person. They're all trained up. They're a great lawyer and economist, and we'll put them there yeah. for you. Like, I, I just, I just want to say this to help people out. I, I, I mean that, you know, it's just you really, it's about, you need to have a kind of, I'm, I'm hoping just, I'm hoping paradigm shifts and I'm hoping mine's getting blown, not to be like, oh, great episode, but just really like, so that the people of God can really survive and discern. Because let me tell you something. A devil manifesting, like on the one hand, you don't want that on the, on the micro. You don't want that because if you've ever experienced it, you don't, you don't got control like you think you do. You know what I mean? But even that is a blessing from God. God's allowing that to be shown for your repentance. 
So when you see something so overt, like the line of the government that like Tuck's talking about, that's a blessing because the intoxication of the powers allows their hubris to begin to kind of like dumb them up and and, and they show their they they they're showing their towel. The, the towel's there. Are you following me? That's a blessing. It's the stuff that you don't see, that's when you should be scared. Like that, it's these things that are happening. So like by the time you get something super overt that happens at your in your in your family, in your own life, where it's like, whoa, the devil, it's like you need to like make the sign across and go, thank you, Lord, because you're warning me, you're helping me. Because what that means is there's something that is coming or something that's God is wanting you to be like prepared for and to really take a look at. That the, the, the devil doesn't want you to know he exists. The devil doesn't want the tells. Like the tells are are kind of like god making play by some rules are you following me and so these these overt signs of corruption in government it's like that should be your warning sign to be like yeah this is why i can't buy into the binary republicans are the good guys like you can't buy into that you know what i mean because when you see something so obvious right and you buy into it that's the trap right you have to that's your sign to be like okay I'm going to step back and I'm going to be like, I can't buy into left or right. All right, Lord, show Lord. me what is the real thing. Does this make you, you follow me yeah. on that? No, this it, is 2020. It, it, makes, it, makes, it makes perfect. Well, but it's going to 2020 and like, I'm going to like, I'm going to, I'm going to amplify this father because I think 2020 is the prime example. I'm going to say a name who is the personification of what we're talking about. Deborah mm-hmm. Burks. B-I-R-X. The doctor? Deborah, she is not a doctor father, but that's interesting that you think she is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She has We're no medical. Though. She has no medical training. Yeah. Wow. But she ran the entire U.S. response mm. in 2020. She has. A, she is not a medical professional. She is not a scientist. Do you know her background? No. Does anybody mm-hmm. know where she came from? No. Have you heard anything from her since? No. Did she get hauled in front of Congress like Fauci? No. Hmm. So Fauci but would yet, be ev- the the power, or Fauci would be the principality, and she'd be the power. Is that what you're trying? Well, to say? there's what what I'm saying is is that it's just more complex, right? Yeah. The other thing, Fauci, okay, Fauci, right? Fauci, the Reaper. <laughs> when it, the the Reaper went. So a lot of people don't know this. Fauci was the highest paid U.S. government employee Hmm. before 2020, Mm -hmm. Mm. before COVID. And he was really involved with AIDS. Yes, he was. Very much so. Super involved with AIDS. But did anybody know who he was? Did anybody know Mm -hmm. who he was before 2020? Okay, but now I want you to think about this. If I was to show you Google, okay? And I was to say, okay, here's a salary, here's a salary chart of all of Google. Who's at the top of the salary chart? Deal? Peter Thiel? Well, what's their position? No, oh. the salaries. Oh, what's sorry. not shareholders? What's the the CEO? Mm. I guarantee you. Yeah. Isn't that the whole thing? Isn't that the whole thing of the left? The CEOs are making this much more than these. Yeah. Because why? Because the CEO is the highest paid person. Mm-hmm. Because the highest paid person in any organization is the leader of that organization. Period. Oh, I see what you're saying. Period. So follow, gotcha. like, follow the money. Follow the like, money. Don't, don't well, look at title. It's, a, it's at least it's at least something to consider as the metric. Like, mm-hmm. wouldn't you think to at least question and be like, wait, who's the highest paid U.S. Uh, employee? And then you're like, oh, it's the head of the National Allergy center like mm-hmm. what what's going on mm. yeah do who who what's his name how come i've yeah. never heard of this guy and then all of a sudden oh he's running everything mm-hmm. he's oh all of a sudden he's got more power than the president and you're like oh wait he always had more power than the president it's just now you see it yeah because well, otherwise how was he paid more around. than the president <laughs> Yep. Now you see it. 
like we started off. Now, now you, you see it. It. it was already it was always ramping up. Always it was there. always heading towards this. But always now you see there. it. Now you see always it. there. Yeah. And that's you know, same thing occurred to me here is I learned who I learned who the highest paid uh this week I learned who the highest paid person here is. And I was sitting with a local who's who's actually from a very good pedigree family, and he was like, Wait, what? Hmm. He gets paid more than the governor? I was like, Yeah. <laughs> like, wait, uh -huh. what? Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> That's a really interesting wow. point. I hadn't thought of it like that before. And I think mm -hmm. that like um you know it's it's really interesting that like um <clears throat> he ended up being who he was because that was actually like a large portion of why the like the gay people that I know supported COVID right away. Well, he was with us during the AIDS thing. He was the only one fighting for the AIDS thing. He was the only one that was saying that this is a real thing. And so suddenly you had a whole population loyal to the Fauci brand who were like, you know, oh, if this guy says this is what happened last well, time, nobody paid which attention. Andrew raises a question, forgive me, raises a question. Wait, but was that one a real thing? Because this one wasn't. You know, <laughs> but there's plenty of people who would argue the case. And I just want to say this, <laughs> I just want to say this because... What's interesting too is the movement to put that constituency in power. Yeah. That was the right? beginning. That, that was the beginning, that's, Father. That's the move. That's that was the how move. they normalized it. That was yeah, how they normalized the it. That's the move. And if you think yeah. about it, you're like, wait a minute. That's too coincidental. <laughs> And it, That's a little it, too coincidental. It it's also interesting because I talked about this with a, a gay friend of mine one time, who said, um, "I was like, well, you know that there is like a there is a hundred percent or like a ninety nine point nine 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 percent effective uh, device for stopping AIDS, right? So condom. let's believe the narrative for one second. It's a condom, right?" Yeah. The problem is, is that is not convenient while a mask is. So you could say, well, there's another device that could be used. That's that's 100 percent effective for, for for ceasing the spread. It just doesn't really impact my life too much. Yeah, the mask sucks, but whatever. But a condom, you're I'm sure everyone can fill in the blank on like why a condom would not want to be used in that particular situation. It's like, OK, mm -hmm. so this device that is meant to stop the spread of this thing that's just happening all over the place, this massive outbreak of this virus, there is a way to stop it. But by his own admission, nobody wanted to do that. Everyone was like, we don't want to do that. They were all for doing throwing away shot glasses at bars. And he talked about the, the impact of sales on like um, mosquito repellent. Because mm -hmm. there's a thought that it could be spread through mm -hmm. mosquitoes. They're all mm -hmm. about doing all that stuff short of the one thing that would decrease sensation during, you know, homosexual yeah. relations or whatever. Well, That's the one thing they couldn't go to. And it's, well, it's because it's now impacting my ability to feel pleasure in this thing that I really, really like. So I don't want to do that. But and work. that's why. Yeah. But that's also why people always come down to atheists and um, homosexual like that's why they don't want God it's not that they don't believe it's not that they can't they sound like they, they don't really believe it's nonsensical it's that they don't want something someone telling them what they want to do is wrong I know that someone's going to be upset with me that's too that's a crude argument I'm just telling you in the heart of hearts of these people these atheists and, the, and these homosexual people that's what it is right because that's one of the reasons why the rise of the Antichrist is going to be swift. You already see it now. Because people want to, people are seeing, like with the end of scientism, right, which the bricklayers are orchestrating to, to weave back another thing. How do you reconcile that? No problem. We're just going to have a we're going to have a Jesus that's gonna be tolerant, all accepting. Like we're gonna have a Jesus that's not holy, basically. Sure. We're gonna have a Jesus that's nice. And, and you want to indulge that, your passions? 
You want to indulge your passion? No problem. Sure, you're good. No, no problem. problem. No that problem. will not prevent you from being saved. No problem. Which is like, and, which is like, no, wait a minute. That's exactly what you're being saved from. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and, and that's, that's why the antichrist thing is so real. Like it's more real than people realize, you know, and, and for those reasons, because, um, I mean, we're all seeing it. Like I, atheism is on, I think we're, we're going to see a turn on, um, within these next, I don't know how long we have, but you're already seeing it where people are like, yeah, you know, atheism is really kind of not really a thing. It's right? passe. It's passe. It's passe. It's passe. What's the, know? what's the guy, the, 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 the classic, uh, who's, who's the guy, the, the new, the main new atheist guy, Jordan Peterson's nemesis. What's his oh, name? Sam what's Harris. Sam Harris. Sam Harris yeah. is a joke now. Everybody mm. views him as a joke. There was a time when this guy was like really respected as a public intellectual and people would listen to him. Now people just, they just, <laughs> they just clown him constantly. Yeah. 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 So it's over. Yeah. That whole thing so is it's, done. Father, where do you see the people that were atheists like that, that type of um, set or whatever, that like um, personality type, where do you see them going? Like, because it, evangel evangelical christianity is not doing well right it's like um and then like i don't know how popular eastern religions are i mean is that where you No, religion of the future andrew they're going to they're going to the they're oh, going to the sure. ai transhumanism they're the transhumanists sure. now yeah there's the trend news with it but like but forgive me you know i'm sorry i just forgive me whatever i'm just gonna oh, say yeah. we're um you're already seeing they're going to have their own Orthodox church. Oh. They're going to have, they, they have the Catholic church. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As long as it, because oh, yeah. look, you got, you got, forgive me, love and respect to all you conservative Catholics. I mean that. I mean that all of you who are like languishing, God bless you. I'm not even being facetious, but like, let's just be frank. Right. Um, remember when Francis came in, everybody loved him. Yeah. I mean, the world still loves them. Yeah, they do. Right. And the fact of the matter yeah, is, is like, like conservative Catholics, like, I don't know what they think. I could be wrong. So just like that person who's like, you guys are wrong about <laughs> Catholic celibacy. Catholic, yeah, Catholic celibacy. So I'm sure, I'm sure someone's going to come and say I'm wrong about this. But the reality is, is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All you, you know, seat of a contest and you bias mm -hmm. the 13th, like all, all you fringe. He's not the real Pope. You guys are done. You guys have been done. You're like yeah. wacko holdouts. It's you know? silly. You're like, They're dead enders, silly. really. You, yeah. You guys are dead enders, right? Because at the end of the day, it's the Pope. And it's just kind of like, yeah, these Catholics who want to be like, I'm really Catholic and he's not my Pope. Well, guess what? That's how it works for you guys. You know what I mean? That's how it works. That's so the like, rules. That's the rules. <laughs> that's the, that's the rules, right? So that's where you're headed. If that's if that's what's going on. I'm, I know. Forgive me. You know, I'm just saying. You know, with all due love and respect, become Orthodox. So that's the other side of it. Is we're seeing it now rise. It's like there's look in Greece. There's going to be the state church the, under the EP, and you know, mm -hmm. surrogates and gay marriage and all that stuff. And then, oh, father, they else, are going to have a. They are going to have AI clergy. I'm just letting you know. The Latin yeah, Church for sure is going to have AI clergy. I guarantee why you. And, why not? And what and whatever the Latin Church does, then and unfortunately, the the world orthodoxy of, under the EP and the fake Ukrainian Orthodox Church are going to be all that too, right? And then and that way you don't need because they can just look at the real church and be like, oh, those are the fundamentalists. You know, just let them go die out. They're the ones who didn't want to get poked. They're the ones who did whatever and just relegate them. Like they need to go be in their leper colony. Right. But we're we're the ones who have really loved the world. We're the ones who represent Jesus because we love the world and Jesus loves you and and, and all, all this stuff. And I know I sound like a terrible guy, but it's just the truth, you know? So I say that to be that's where those people are going. They don't need to go any. I mean, there's going to be an Orthodox Church for them. There's going to be whatever they want. That like the Antichrist is going to have mantia, ponytail, beard. He's going to have whatever people want him to have. Mm -hmm. Like that. Like that's the thing. You're, 
he's not going to be anti-Orthodox, right? He's going to do everything that's going to make segments, large segments okay. of quote unquote orthodoxy be like, yeah, this is. He will be anti-Orthodox because he'll be in place of Orthodox. In place of. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. Was, that was just a father turkey joke. Could, yeah. I was just trying to be a father yeah, turkey joke. And to keep the but joke train a going, because uh, the trip, don't make no mistake, gentlemen, the, the joke train is a going. Uh, Saint, somebody came to the St. Pais, it was like a Catholic priest came to him and said, like, you, you know, we should pray for them electing the new Pope. And St. Pius just winked and was like, oh, I'm sure he'll be infallible. Like, don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, this is what you guys signed up for. I've never been Catholic. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm kind of okay with being like, it, my wife and I, my wife was raised Catholic. I was raised Protestant. We both continue to take pot shots at each other's like upbringing. Be like, wow, really? Like, really? There was like. Yeah. People just needed to say seven words and they were saved. Like, that's it. Like, <laughs> yeah, apparently. I mean, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my master. And I can't remember what they are. But, like, it's like, um, I remember doing that with someone one time. I realized I just the master of grace school. <laughs> I just, just like, there's got to be more to this besides that, right? I mean, that's it. But... I have the power. Yeah, I'm the power. <laughs> Well, I think that's a good place to end it because yes. there might be, maybe, might be one of my children waking up. So I should probably go. Okay. Fair but, enough. Let's do um, it. So um, please reach out to us at royalpathcontact.network. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the people who reach out, Andrew Funk at royalpath.network um, mm -hmm. or Andrew at royalpath.network. I don't remember which one it is. One of those will work. Um, anytime we mention some a musical artist, we try and put it on a playlist that's on Apple Music and Spotify, uh, Royal Path Podcast playlist or something like that. Uh, check out our merch store, royalpath.store. We don't see any of that money. It goes either to the parish or to um or to uh the people who made it. Uh thank you, um Jack. Jack is is mm -hmm. Jack the, yeah, Jack yeah. is yep. Jack. Jack's the man. Um just Jack. You are awesome. And St. Christopher has been popping up a lot in my life right now. And mm. when I saw that you chose him as the as the thumbnail for the last episode, I was just like, okay, truly, truly something is going on with St. Christopher right now. So mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it was pretty powerful. So I just want to say thank you, Jack. Like that that was pretty that was pretty awesome. Glory to God. That was pretty that was pretty awesome. Um, then also Scola, Scola Coffee, check it out. Um it's uh it's it's all the rage now of the uh coffee drinking orthodox in america world it's it's mm -hmm. pretty great um and then beyond that i think well i also want to throw a little something out um lazar saturday is coming up the pentagon's coming up so if anyone is getting baptized please remember to check out the convent of the mother of god the secret of the lost uh and the baptismal robes made by the nuns here that would be very oh, awesome yes. And um, coming up soon, um, very, very, very soon, enough for me to announce it, is that the nuns are also going to be producing, um, uh, selling icons. Um, and icons that I've, that, that I've made. So, like, the Terror of Demons is coming. The Terror of Demons icon. Oh, wow. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so, finally, that's going to be released. Uh, icon St. Mary, Soften Evil Hearts. Um, icon of uh, Revelation 19 is coming. So stay posted for that. The nuns are producing that. Also, um, very soon they're going to unleash a whole store with Akathis that have been written and other very helpful materials. So I just kind of want to get people to kind of periodically be checking uh, the comments website because some great stuff is coming out there very, very soon. I'm sure. Like, soon. We put the link in the description. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will do that. I will so do that. This is, this is, and I'm, I'm not right. I'm not profound and I'm, I'm certainly not like very insightful about this stuff, but about those rust belt, like ethnic churches, ethnic churches yeah. that like shut down, maybe there really did need to be a changing of the guard for orthodoxy in America. And I'm not saying that like that it was good that those churches shut down. I'm not saying that, but I think that there are churches now that are more culturally 
able to address some of the specific mm. problems we run into in America, in Babylon. That, yes, and, and I, I love that because we are in Babylon, mm. right? We are, we are the, the diaspora in Babylon to kind of correlate with the Old Testament. But I want to say this. Your observation is correct, and our Lord has no problem removing a lampstand. Right, if you if any of you guys are familiar with Revelation, right, and the removing of the lampstand from the churches that were not faithful, right, like Smyrna and stuff, and so beyond the kind of like regional his- history that is true that you know those churches were removed historically, but that spirituality always is at play, and so when someone is not faithful to what the commission of the gospel is, to holding to the the gospel, you know, bringing the gospel to all nations, right. Um, they, you know, the Lord is is able and willing. It's his it's his church. This is his church. So he's willing to take the lampstand. So that being said, I would say that warning to everyone. You know, I it's it's always I never take for granted what God's given, like our parish or anything like that, because you either strive to please the master or you live in fear of him taking his lampstand from you. Right. So Ooh. let it be a warning to everybody especially hotshot convert parishes that think they know everything, you know, <laughs> looking at you mm-hmm. insert parish here. I don't know which one, but <laughs> anyway. Um, and I mean, sobering, sobering. That's, that's the key thing is, is like, we're not like, look at us. We're doing it right. It's like, no, I mean, there's, it could, it could be taken. So, you know, striving mm-hmm. is fear. The Lord's beginning of wisdom. Oh. Hey, that's a great place to end it right there. So that's it. Um, Thank you, everyone, and thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.